Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont show. I have an incredible guest with me, and we will talk about her in a minute. But first, I want to um, announce what we're doing. So, um, Straight Talk Vermont and all our other programs, we have a new art gallery or in the University Mall. It's a re -grand, We just did a re-grand opening um, May 20th, and it's incredible. It's called Art So Wonderful Gallery and Performing Center, and it's 8,000 square feet. We have a, a, a performing stage. We're going to have like hip hop, rock shows, open mic, poetry slams. Vermont Youth Symphony Orchestra is going to perform there. And I'm so excited. And we have like 400 pieces of art in there. And when I sit in there, oh God, I'm so excited. You look at all this art. I'm not an artist, but, but I'm a musician. But I just have the passion for both. So I open the place up. But I'm telling you, you got to come there. It's in the University Mall, right next to Target's across from IHOP. So um, that's what we have um, going on. Um, oh, no, we have a Fight for Kids Foundation. I'm on the board of directors. We built a youth center in Winooski. It's the only youth center there. And I'm so proud. Um, King James is our executive director. We have some incredible board members. And we're doing First Fridays every month, starting July 7th in Rotary Park in Winooski. All these providers and vendors are going to be there, live entertainment. And it's helped raise funds for the uh, Fight for Kids Foundation. So if you got time, step out there. So now, everyone. I'm so excited. And I see every time I see Senator Rams Hensdale, I always get excited. I don't care where I'm at, you know, where we are, we always wave to each other, acknowledge each other, and we we go way back like 15 years. So right now I want to introduce you to Senator Rams Hensdale. So take it away. Thanks so much, Bruce. I'm Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale. And before I say anything else uh, about me, I'm just remembering uh, since it is July 5th, it was three years ago on the 4th of July uh, that it was just after the murder of George Floyd. And we had the kids from Art So Wonderful do chalk art at AO Glass uh, in the south end of Burlington. And they made beautiful images of hands of all different colors and complexions holding each other's. They wrote Black Lives Matter. They did an amazing job. And so I just want to thank you for giving young people that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about me, Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale. I Hold up, it's yeah. Just a, oh, a little bit about you. Oh. <laughs> Let's go over the whole bag. Let's. Okay. Okay. Well. I'll, go, I'll start with the titles, um, and the most important one for me right now is mom. Um, I'm a new mother, and I'm here with my baby Mira. She's <laughs> two and a half months old now, and uh, she was supposed to arrive the last day of the legislative session, but of, for, of course my first lesson as a parent was that uh, babies, you know, make the rules. So she decided to come early, and I reported and passed a lot of my legislation from the hospital this year. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I passed legislation as the chair of the Senate Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs Committee in the state Senate. Uh, I've served for 11 years now in the legislature yes. since I was 22. So if you're young and thinking about running for office, I'm always free to talk. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. So, um, and I'm just going to talk to the boomer. Then. Um, so, um, Senator. Um, oh, wow. So, Mira is here, right? Well, let's get a shot of Mira. Bro, Travis, our cameraman and in, incredible um, guy from CCTV. Nice, right? So I, I just want to say um, thank you to CCTV and our, our, our camera uh, person and production person, um, Travis. And we are in the lovely um, Battery Park where we always be. We have our cable show. This is our second time with um, Senator um, Case Ram. And um, here, we did this before, right here in the same park. I don't know how many years ago that was, maybe. It's before the Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. But um, so, wow, well, I keep saying wow because you have an incredible history of all the wonderful things. You met some incredible people, you know, like Obama, and you know, yeah, I got to always say that, Obama, baby. You know, and like, um, let us start from when you graduated from uh, probably while you was in um, UVM when you went to the legislature, I think. I started my campaign for the State House of Representatives representing Burlington when I was a senior at the University of Vermont. I was student body president, um, and really a lot of uh, a lot of my mentors, people like Governor Madeline Kunin and uh, Rachel Weston, who was a young legislator herself, the only legislator in her 20s at the time, 
um, you know, they basically said to me, your student body president, the district is very young, so you represent over half of the people who live in the district. They just don't tend to vote because they're young and they're not registered. So I registered a couple thousand young people to vote, memorized the Freeman's Oath when you had to administer that, um, you know, when people were registering to vote, now you don't have to do that anymore. And uh, I won by the largest margin of any challenger to incumbents in the state that year. That was 2008. It was another time when we needed hope and to feel like young people, um, you know, millennials at the time were the young people graduating college, wanting to live on the cusp of change. Gen Z, stepping up, rising up, you know, that this is an important time to think about what your future looks like and take control, you know, pass, get the, tor the torch passed to you respectfully, you know, but make sure that you're there to receive it with respect and with, uh, with courage. No doubt, no doubt. And like, wow, you was like a senior in 2008 at UVM. Isn't that something? And um, you legislator, yes, exactly. You exactly what we need and still need today because you um, voice a lot of um, opinions and ideas and use their um, youth ideas and suggestions on how we can get better in the state of Vermont. And um, and you've you've I'm like I keep saying because I can't think of you do so much that my brain is like growing in circles right now. But um, was you registered two thousand students, man, to be um, registered to vote? You know. How important was that? You know, that was so important. Yeah, I mean, Bruce, you and I share a real passion for the voices of young people. You know, they, I always say they're not the future, they're the present. Mm -hmm. They're not going to inherit this country and this planet. We're borrowing it from them. So we have to be thinking not like we're entitled to the present, but that we are uh, here to take care of it for, for future generations and make sure that, you know, I often say to them too, you don't give me hope because that means I'm sort of giving up and handing it over to you. You give me courage and you give me the courage to speak up and make space so that you have an easier time when you're leading. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, it's still really important to me to talk to young people, engage with young people. But importantly too, they have their own agenda and their own needs in Vermont. And, you know, I, I read recently that um, young people, especially children, uh, you know, when you look at the difference in how much money government gives to children versus seniors, in European countries, it might be three times more money, three times more, more wealth and more benefit goes to seniors. In the United States, it's about 30 times more. Wow. So, you know, it's important that we share resources with everyone, um, but it's really, really important that we recognize that children and young people are really underrepresented and they need housing, they need affordable higher education, they need safety, they need their rights secured, and they're highly underrepresented in government. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Well, one thing that I, you know, admire you so much, I've seen your growth, you know, for many years, and, um, you just keep getting smarter and smarter and more wisdom. Good. You got, well, that's, 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 I know, right? <laughs> and plus, you know, you got your wisdom is getting larger because then you, Thank all you. the incredible people you know and met and your mentors. Um, but, you know, like everything works in divine order night before, you know what I'm saying? We already know that. And so, um, because of you, you know, like um, the inspiration, you always empower you. If you always say, you know, when you started, you, always, you know, even today you said it. You, Please look at me. You can do this too, and you will help. And I'll help you. You know what I'm saying? How important is that? You know, I mean, for young people to hear high school and college age youth students, and even graduates, you know, students, you know, who have all this uh, aspiration and ambitions to um, help want to change something in the world or Vermont or their community, right? For Chittenden, right? Chittenden, yes, Chittenden, Chittenden County. It used to be the whole county, mm -hmm. and we cut the representation in half so that there's three senators oh, in each chunk oh, of the county. Just because six, it was daunting for a lot of people to run, right? If you're a young person, that might be that might be hard for you. Yeah. And and, and your district is, I mean, what, what's your neighborhood? What's that? Uh, you you um you um what district is that? So I'm I'm Chittenden Southeast. Southeast. We just made these uh, districts in the last biennium of the legislature, the last from 20 to 2020 to 2022. So this was the first election that people elected separate. Uh, senators in different parts of the county. Um, my district is Burlington South End, mm -hmm. uh, South Burlington, mm -hmm. and then most of what I would call the little towns in Chittenden County. Little compared to the rest of the state might not be so little, 
but you know Shelburne, Charlotte, Hinesburg, Richmond, Jericho, Underhill. So we kind of horseshoe around the, the all the little towns in the county. I think it's really nice because then there's not just one community's voice that's heard. We go to all the little communities yeah. and, and connect with people. That's so important because since you said that, <clears throat> one another thing I admire about you is that um you know it's like our friend um, Senator Bernie Sanders. You know what I mean? We, I work. We both work, and I work for him for many years as a congressman. And, and, and then I, you know, when I see him, he, hey, Bruce, hey, you know. Yeah. And so we still, I still work with him mentally, and, you know, whatever he's trying to do, I'll help him with, based on what I can do. Um, but you, like him, or he, like you, <laughs> will go to, you want, you know, if, you, if you say such and such some person said something to you, or Sally said this to me in our district, and that we need to do this, that, and other, you know, and when you say that on, it was publicly, you mean it, you know what I'm saying? Because you, you literally, you really talk to Sally, you know what I'm saying? It ain't no joke, you know, because you be there, you travel around your community, you find out what, what needs are, needs and assessments are, you, you come back and you work on them, you know what I'm saying? And that's, how important is that? Guys, listen to the people who you serve, right? You, 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 you serve them, they don't serve you, you know what I'm saying? So you gotta listen to them. Well, I think Bernie and President Obama, for example, mm -hmm. they really modeled what it looks like to be effective because you have the people behind you. And so, you know, one way you can lead is by sheer force or by doing things in secrecy or whatever the case may be. But the best way to lead, the way that no one can argue with you, is if you're co-governing with the people and you're hearing directly from them and you're saying, you know, I'm out there talking to majority people and this is what I'm hearing. That happened with housing this year. I chair the committee that deals with housing. And everywhere you'd go, people would say, I'm, you know, I can't even find a place to rent. I'm living in a motel. You know, mm -hmm. I'm um, struggling to find a, a place that I can buy. Right. We have a family and we're, we're right. outgrowing our space. Right. And, you know, we started this housing bill and we were working on it for six weeks, you know, nonstop. And people kept saying, well, you still have to deal with other issues. And then a poll came out. Um, an opinion poll said, what's the number one issue in the state? And 39% of Vermonters said housing. Wow. The second top thing was like 12% or something. I mean, everyone was saying housing. So, you know, it's like we knew that by intuition and by listening to people. And then, you know, you get backed up by information down the road. But you can't wait and put your finger to the wind to lead. You have to start the work and then, you know, lead where others can follow. And so that's also, since you said you're talking about housing, um, I'm on, I'm on Chittenden County, County Planning Commission, yeah. and I sit on the board of directors for um, social economics and housing. And of course, as housing, as you said, so much, wow, do we even have places to build more housing? Um, so you voted on, uh, did you, um, maybe you did vote on it. the bill. I think. Well, you, yeah, you wrote that bill. Yeah. <laughs> The home bill. Right. So, so the, the guys voted on um, getting uh, to keep the hotels. Yes. Yeah. So a lot has happened, and and I I plan to do more communicating with um, the public and taking feedback to to discuss these issues. Um, you know, my what what can be frustrating, and, and bear with me here, is my committee deals with housing in terms of building the housing for people to live in. When someone doesn't have a home, that's the human services committee. And I think for much of the session. We were both asking the administration, what's going on? What do you need? And, you know, certainly my committee was hearing, we need more housing to be built. That's what we did. We focused on every type of housing, senior housing. I mean, you have people in the motels who are on oxygen, who can't get out of bed. They need to be somewhere else, yeah. and we need to make sure that yeah. they have that place to be, a skilled yeah. nursing facility or assisted living. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we need more recovery housing where mm -hmm. people are safe as they try to, um, you know, yeah. deal with substance use disorder. Um, so, you know, we had all kinds of things we were hearing, and we were trying to build that as fast as we could. Yeah. What we weren't hearing is that there was no data and no plan for where these folks would go right. where they were when they were exited. Sure. You know, some people say, oh, but other people were telling you, well, we try to trust the administration. And all of a sudden it felt like the administration realized they didn't have a plan. You know, they didn't have shelters for people to go to. They didn't, they hadn't built the capacity up for emergency housing. Um, and so we passed an emergency amendment during the veto session so that we could ensure, um, you know, people were able to stay who need the housing the most in the motels to keep the program alive until next April. Right. Now, what I want to say is, you know, 
We're, that was for 700 people? That was for 700 people? No, this you, is for about 2,200 people. Oh. The, the number of people that were exited, about 700, they were exited, you know, before we were able to get back into session. And, we, you know, we might not know a whole lot about them, but, um, you know, we tried to make sure that if you have kids, you can stay. If you have a, a disability, you can stay. If you're a senior, you can stay. Any vulnerable population. Um, we have tried to make other options available for people who, frankly, you know, we're living in the motels for a long time right. and are still able-bodied, might be a single person. Right. There's a couple reasons I, I want to highlight this. I don't want to shy away from it. I know it's hard for people to swallow. We don't want anyone to be on the streets. But number one, it's about $150 a night to keep them in those motels. Those motels don't belong to us, you know, so they're if they're getting uh you know used up and there's a lot of wear and tear you know it's costing a lot for us yeah, to keep yeah, people in motels we don't have infinite amounts of money so we need to use that money to build permanent housing for people mm -hmm. so we couldn't keep paying you know millions and millions of dollars um the second thing i want to say is if someone's in a motel room they're a finite resource and someone else can't get in a motel room right. so if the oh. motel is full in chittenden county right. then somebody else is sleeping in their car with their kids and so, you know, we have to, we, that was happening a lot during the pandemic. We need to be able to keep some of those motel rooms available and open for people who are in a really bad situation. Plus, use them for uh, tourism. So that's the other, that's a third thing, really. And, and, you know, one thing I said on VPR recently was that one of the groups nobody was talking to was the motel owners, right? A lot of them are Indian community members. I see them at holiday events. And they have been housing providers, right? They have been knowing who can't get out of bed, who needs oxygen, who, you know, where they should consolidate people who have similar care needs. And so they've been trying to communicate to the state as well. Some of them have wanted to do a rent to own agreement. You know, we're not going to be able to turn this back into a tourism spot. So why don't, if you keep paying all this money, why don't you just buy it at some point? Um, many of them are ready to sell those buildings and we've put aside millions and millions of dollars to buy those motels. The other thing is, you know, if they don't, uh, if, if they don't want to sell the motel and they want to do tourism again, they really can't do both at the same time. You know, you can't have people detoxing um, or, you know, people who need a high level of care right next to the family that's, you know, here to visit for the fall leaves. It's just not the same use and it's really tough on their management to make that all work. They, so some of the motel owners have talked about consolidating people who need care into certain motels and then transferring those to the state. They have creative ideas and we need to start listening by April. Is that 2024? Yes, or? April of 2024 is when, and even then, it's there's off ramps because these people all have to have somewhere to go. Everyone can be exited as long as we have a affordable option with their name on it because you do have a lot of people in the motels who are saying, I literally can pay rent. I just can't find a place to live in Vermont. That's what we're dealing with, and it's not going to happen without us tr transferring those resources to permanent housing and getting those regulations out of the way so we can build housing where we think we need it, which the Regional Planning Commission has been designating for us, you know, in core downtowns, in walkable communities. Yeah, well, well it's tough because, um, and I'm, I thank you for working hard and doing the bill and, you know, working hard to keep um, individuals in safe places off the street, you know, I mean, where they can be with them for themselves and their family, you know, it's so important. Systemic, that's part of our systemic need. Right. I mean, it's not like one of our systemic needs is not to be a billionaire, you know what I'm saying? But for you need food, you need transportation, you need water, you need somewhere, you know, the right. safe place, right? That's systemically what we all need. I always say, you know, people care about the crisis in our democracy. They care about the crisis in our can't really address those crises if they're having a crisis in their family or their personal life. Yeah. You can only deal with one crisis at a time, and the personal really consumes you. Yeah, no doubt. So, so let us say in April of 2024, um, that's that's how that's your um, amended you amended to that term, right? And so, it, for some dumb reason, it fails. Everything fails. So, where are people going to go? What are they going? What are we going to do? There's going to be a, well, you, you know, it's going to be an influx of individuals in the woods on the streets, you know, doing the best they can to survive, you know, in probably in an unhealthy environment in, um, you know, where there's they meeting their, their systemic needs. And where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Yeah. I mean, what are they going to you know, I don't think you can build no place in, in t from now to like a, <laughs> you need a skyscraper travel, <laughs> you know, to build a place where people can live, you know what I'm saying, in, in, um, before your timeline is up. 
You're right. Or you, I'll, I'll just add to what you're saying. Those motels, we want to buy them, but we also want to make sure that they're livable for people. A lot of them don't have kitchens. A lot of them, you know, people are living in a motel. That's not a great option for them either because they might have a whole family, no kitchen, no privacy. So we're trying to buy those motels and transfer them into permanent housing with kitchens, with partitions as as, uh, as much as we can. So I hear exactly what you're saying. I'm not saying we can't fail. Um, and we have created, like I said, a lot of contingencies, a lot of ways to say, if we are failing at this, you know, we are still keeping those folks housed at this expensive rate, which is not a great option for them either, just because of the, like I said, the lack of privacy, the one room motel. Um, but we are keeping them housed. And that's why the governor is now on the hook to, to move a little faster to get housing developed. And that's why the governor asked us to expedite the provisions of my bill as well. And what I will say is the provisions of my bill, the home bill, are also similar to what's happening all over the country. We are not alone in this housing and homelessness crisis. We, you know, and I'm not saying we shouldn't welcome them as Vermonters, but we do have people coming from other states. This is a regional crisis and a national crisis. And all of our states, especially in the North, are figuring out that what we had for a long time was polite segregation, was the idea that we would say, you know, if you build duplexes and fourplexes, then you invite those people into the neighborhood, those people whose food smells different, who fixes their car in the driveway, who bring problems to our neighborhood. You, and those people I'm using in quotes to say that a lot of discrimination has happened when it comes to what starter housing looks like for people. Listen, I started in a duplex. The governor started in a duplex. Many Vermonters couldn't afford to live here if they didn't start with something that they owned where they could rent another piece out or have a family member live with them in another piece of their home. And now we're saying that housing is, you know, undesirable. So we've zoned it out of a lot of communities. Our bill as of Janu as of July 1st, so four days ago, um, our bill made sure that you can create a duplex anywhere in Vermont by right. Anywhere that you can create a single family home, you can create a duplex. So ending discrimination against multifamily housing is something that's going to get housing built the way Vermonters want to see it, you know, cottages, duplexes, things that look like a barn as a, as a fourplex, you know, they can look really nice. I like those barns. Exactly. But, you know, the rest of the country is doing the same thing. The same year we passed an end to single family zoning, so did Washington, Montana, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. Maine. So every state is saying we haven't built enough housing and especially housing that the average person can afford as their first home. So in addition, we've, we're creating first generation home buyer grants. We're doing all kinds of things to tackle the vast need for housing that people have. And like I said, I think one of the most critical forms of housing we need to create is senior housing. You know, Cathedral Square is right behind us. They have a waiting list of three years for wow. people to get in. And those are people who've committed their life to Vermont. They, they up high. Exactly. Those are folks who are on that waiting list, want to get out of their huge homes mm. that they can't afford to heat, oh, that they yeah, can't yeah. afford to take care sure, of the yard, sure. and get into assisted living sure. so those homes can be available sure. to Vermont families. Yeah. Well, across the, probably the world, um, individuals who um, come into situations where they have to like live in hotels are... Um, probably economically challenged and I think that you, you know some of the people who lives in these hotels are can can, can just can't find a place mm -hmm. as you said mm -hmm. but economically challenged means that you have to live in a place that um, it could be in the woods or it could be any any on couch to couch you know and usually mm -hmm. that tends to high risk high risk because that's a that's what happens when you get an economically challenged neighborhood. If you're living in the ghetto, guarantee you're gonna see some gangsters, you're gonna see drug dealers, you're gonna oh, you hear some shootings, you know. So when you put, and I work with these individuals for many years, you know, and you know, and if you put people all together that's economically challenged, who's been living in these high risk environments, then what? How does that? What does that? What does that do? You you got all, a lot of people in the same place that's economically challenged. That come from the woods in high risk environments. How that? How is that going to work? Yeah. Well, Bruce, what you're doing is giving me the opportunity to go back and just say, so that people know why I'm so passionate about this. You know, my family home was foreclosed when I was a kid. My sister struggles with uh, bipolar disorder, and she was homeless for a while in Los Angeles. You know, just feeling. Um, she just felt re-traumatized and unsafe at home, and chose instead to live on the streets. That was really painful for our family. 
Um, you know, but of course what we wanted more than anything was for her to be safe. So, you know, many families have experienced housing insecurity and the divide between whether or not you've experienced housing insecurity or not is so huge and it's growing, right? Because if you own your home right now, you've basically won the lottery without doing very much. Right. Home prices have never been higher and they've never climbed as quickly as they have in this pandemic with the housing crisis we have. So renters are now facing, you know, a higher and higher burden and then all the rungs on the ladder get more and more stuck you know you're you can't afford a place to rent you can't find a place to even get shelter you can't find a motel room you're on the streets and you become either re-traumatized or you know gain new traumas you didn't have before um, what you're talking about is congregate housing which a lot of folks are moving away from you know big open shelter complexes places where you don't have the dignity of a door you can close and lock and maybe you know a window of your own I mean we're moving away from that that type of housing where people are all mushed together in one big space um, and what we need to do is let our housing ecosystem, our housing providers, uh, do their work because they get it. No one's closer to the, to the need and closer to the pain. Um, you know, as you as you probably remember, Reese, uh, earlier this year we had a, a young woman who um, was axed to death by someone in in housing who you know. I'm gonna go ahead and guess is experiencing a lot of maybe trauma, um, delusional thinking, but you know, ended up murdering someone else um, and is now is now on trial for that. And when you look at situations like that, we need to give the resources directly to those putting themselves in harm's way to try and provide housing to others, and let them do their work. They are the ones asking for permit reform because they know that a majority of the community wants affordable housing, wants. Uh, care rich so you know service provision in those housing complexes and then one neighbor can disagree with that and push that out of the way where people need it push it out of downtowns or they can you know stop the project altogether or make it a lot more expensive so no one more than our housing provider said please get some of these permit duplicative permit processes out of the way so we can afford to build more housing and you look at you know the mayor talked about building a shelter in downtown Burlington. That should have happened years ago. We should already have a shelter in downtown Burlington. So part of our bill was that you can't regulate the hours and the seasons, the, the timeline of those shelters. You might be able to you know, make sure that they're professionally operated, but you can't say it's pushed out of the neighborhood or it can't operate effectively at all because we're, we're saying it can't operate for more than these hours. Wow, you, that's straight enough. Um, so talking about the um elmwood street shelters 35 I, I, I keep i don't want to call it pods because people came to me and said you you know what that, that, that's a pod person and I, that's that's pitiful no. you know that's pitiful to call somebody a pod person because that's the way they was people was calling it from upper levels was saying this was these pods they didn't want to call it like elmwood burlington elmwood street sh um shelters yes. they was calling the pods yeah. too and so so um, I guess that's what the mayor put together, you know, him and his team, um, um, him, him and his team um, put that put that together. That was their idea of using some of the federal funding to do that. And so for me, and I told all of them, the mayor and all of them, you know, CETO and, you know, the housing, you know, that I didn't like the idea. Yeah. I thought it was <laughs> almost said something travel you know <laughs> but uh but and that's the go there as well. yeah. <laughs> but i but I but, but i but the reasons why for me you know like you say all right um first of all all these um shelters i think it's 35 or 30 35 um don't have shops you have to go to, to outside to a unit that everybody got to use yeah for to use the bathroom take a shower this that i mean how safe is that first of all you know that to me you know i don't like the idea yeah. you know what i'm saying and then another thing i don't like about it you know is that every place probably in the world like um built projects i'm from chicago so you know i know henry horns caprini greens all those tough projects you know i live in Hyde park with my cousin in the projects and we think i was hanging out in the projects but anyways um Everybody in the world build these type of projects and homes in the highest risk areas of the whole state. Mm -hmm. The highest risk. Now, they started that project right in the old North End, which is better now. 
but you remember it used to be the high, I don't, it was like the highest risk neighborhood in the old town states in King Street. And um and I don't know if it's still I'm bet it still kinda is, you know what I mean? But uh, they built right in the economically challenged highest risk neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And right the first chance they got, right across the boom, yeah. here it is right here. Owner Fed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then I think they spent one point four or something what they spent to do that. But um temporary housing for three years you know, which is all that work and, and stuff is you, you gotta try to find some funny to keep it, you know what I'm saying? You you can't build all that stuff and then, and then not and drop it. You know, how you gonna say, Okay, no, we gotta pack up, you know what I'm saying? No way, and that's too much, you know, it's gonna cost you just as much to pack up mm-hmm. than it is. But anyways. Yes. So so my whole thing, my argument was with the, my art, my program, my art so wonderful program, yeah. did the paintings on the on okay, those on those on, on okay. those on those shelters, yeah. you know, this c- colorizing, yeah, and we did great. that. See, Cedo asked us to do it, but we I d- agreed to do that yeah. because I wanted to make it feel like a whole a place to live. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Some yeah. you know, and that's why I did that, and that's why I said, go ahead, Elizabeth, go do it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then um, that's and why. We disagree with that. Right. I just want to make it feel like. Yeah. like and then I said to these people who central level people who got the well they're not even central level you know you're central level <laughs> you know i'm central level. i'm a commissioner but um who, who are <clears throat> you know decided that we're gonna put these units out here you know i told them you know these individuals um who are wonderful as they are this went through some changes some situations some you know coming off the woods coming up wherever they're coming mm-hmm. from and they economically challenged mm-hmm. and they need housing thank you for doing that for them but you know what they need some cognitive Thinking, they need to go over some thinking errors and patterns and what is conflict resolution? Yeah. How can we get better education? You know yeah. what I'm saying? So I said, I told him I wanted to bring on our straight talk from my program in there, which is about right. thinking errors and patterns and conflict resolution, exercise, right. written drug and alcohol evaluations, and about um, how do you see yourself and yeah. how can we help you yeah. with our partners? You know? Right. And then, so they told me that these people are coming in, like certain organizations coming in, to, um, you can sign up to go to housing, you, can, you want to do art, sign up over, you know, I'm like, sign up, there's got to be some commitment to, if you're going to stay here, right. that you're going to go through some, right. co- some, some go over some thinking of some patterns and help yourself cause with the thinking, because you cannot change your thinking with the same thinking that puts you at risk. You just can't do it. Mm-hmm. You just can't, you got new, new information to change. Mm-hmm. Now, believe me, I know that, because I've been, been there, done that, and I'm, you know, I got a degree in psychology. Right, right. And so, um, they, they, they want to choose their other people who know nothing about um, programs that I created, you know, the thinking errors and patterns and all things that I said. Because thinking errors and patterns, we all fall underneath them, all under them. You know, some people, let me give you an example. Somebody said, yeah, um, I never got uh, arrested. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't have done, done nothing wrong. Have you ever done a 40 and a 30? Yeah, you, you broke the law. So don't, you just didn't get caught. Right. You know what I'm saying? You use some justification, you minimize it, everything, right. and even the police will minimize right. it. Because, like, you probably can do 40, but yeah. you can't do 45, right. and they'll come pull you right over. See, they ain't got their thinking in the law, say, 30. Yeah. So, so we all have used thinking errors and patterns. Yeah. Let me, you know, there's a lot in what you're saying, Bruce, so let me try to summarize. I mean, number okay. one, you know, the those particular pods, they're not... They were the hot new thing when CETO and the and the city purchased them. They might have been the only thing available in mass production, but you've seen a lot of cities say this was not the right answer. Um, you look at Austin, for example, they have the old pods and, you know, white, like you said, they're trying to paint them, trying to make them look like anything, but, you know, like a porta potty, basically, <laughs> like they are very unattractive and small and they don't work below a certain temperature. Ooh, wow. You know, they came from California Whoa. where, mm. you know, that we need something for cold weather. So since then, right, Austin, right next to those pods has put um, these these newer uh, small modular homes that were designed by the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, they're colorful. They're they're insulated and they're easy to put together yourself like you need two people and an allen wrench you just need and and what that alone does is give people agency because the other thing i hear you saying is there's been no agency in all of this there's no what do you like about where you live now in the woods and how do we recreate a place with nature a place where you can or maybe you want to be close to a certain community you know um you want to be close to your favorite spot like what how do we how do we understand why people are living where they are and how to recreate some of that yeah. agency in this different community? Then, you know, um, I, so I'm talking to a woman from Alaska this week who is really, um, she's seen as a leader in creating what, what they call pallet shelters out there. Mm. So that's another term, another fancy term, but <laughs> they're basically building the shelters with the unhoused community. Mm. And they're saying, you know, 
what like what do you want this to look like do you want a, a central gathering place do you want you know a pretty area to put your trash like right, right? like if you give people agency right. and they've decided how they're going to keep themselves you know organized then you've, you've you're much further along right. i'm thinking too we're right in battery park we had the battery park camp right we had a, an occupation of battery of park and over time, those folks who were here started to figure out, okay, we need some, we need people to do trash pickup. We need a, a meeting once a day, you know, where everyone gathers to talk about issues. We need safety. We need, you know, somebody had an AR-15 across from the encampment threatening people in, in the in the encampment because they didn't like, you know, the, the racial justice conversation. So that group had to evolve, you know, their... Um, their what they did they had to get donations so that they had regular meals they did communal living that has some lessons in it you know um and so we have to look at models that have worked that have given people shelter that's year round and where they want to be or gives them some sense of well-being and that you know where they have some agency and they're given the tools they need to be successful and then, you know, services are available if they're ready for those. But, you know, I, I come from Los Angeles originally, where 75% of people who are unhoused are veterans. They have PTSD. They're really struggling with just living within four walls. So you really have to go to the individual and make sure you're providing what they need. We now have veteran-based, you know, housing available in Winooski. We need to do more of that. So, you know, it's, it's really... Um, I think I, I think the governor said this. I mean, we've all said this. We don't have so many homeless people in Vermont, unhoused people in Vermont, that we can't wrap our arms around each one and figure out what they need. Um, and that also requires that, you know, we don't say, we don't push them out of every neighborhood, like you said, but the ones that already have the most need and are most at risk. Um, and that's often what happens. That's a, a total social justice issue. Yeah, so you know, Miro, Miro, I, you know, I like, I like him, you know, a lot. You know, I know his whole family. You know, I like him, you know, on, a, you know, on the personal side. A lot of part of the business side, I don't like a body. You know what I'm saying? But and I let him know, you know. But you know, um, and so I said, I met with him on the, uh, February 24th or something, and I, and um, me and my equity uh, manager, um, and Nelson, and and when I said to him, I said, you know. I just same thing I just said now. I said, you know, this is you built this in the highest risk neighborhood. Da, da, and, and I said, I can understand this is what you had because that vacant park, park a lot or whatever. Saying, you know, but it's, and that's why you used it. And but and I say, but same thing I mentioned earlier that putting people who are high risk, you know, it's high risk when you're living in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's not that you might be doing something, high, but it's high risk you living down there because mm -hmm. you get attacked by a, a rabid raccoon right. or something. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's high risk. Well, and remember they bulldozed. Sears Lane. So mm -hmm. they bulldozed property that was in a wealthier part of town, um, you know, that where people had been living, right, right. Um, where they had found, you know, that they were kind of left alone and they were close to nature. Right. Um, so, you know, they did physically move where they said people could, could stay and live. And I think that's where you get into conversations mm -hmm. about, you know, the right to exist where sure. you where you'd like. The, and our, one of our basic goals in Vermont, our, our principles, is that we will be a successful state when people can live in dignity where they prefer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the core of a lot of intersections of environmental and social justice. Um, you know, Vermont is a beautiful place and everyone should have access to what makes it beautiful. No and so one, th one of the things I said to, um, to uh, the mayor, you know, about the um, shelters on uh, Elwood Street was that you know, these in the wonderful individuals that are, they still was living in high risk. And I mean, high risk is... It, it's or new thinking or help ways get help to get out of the in better betterment you know like the work you do and um and i said you know and then you moved him in the old highest risk neighborhood and i said you know and then downtown city hall park they do all the shootings down there that's all high risk they live in they right there in all those shootings high risk sure enough they had some situation where the police had to be called out to those shelters and uh, some lady got knocked over in her wheelchair and some oh, the head out of camp so and another thing happened you know and so you know, you know that it's gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? That's that's just gonna happen. You, they already moved in a high risk neighborhood. Put it, figure that people were shooting. It's been shooting all downtown, right in that area from City Hall Park, right in that area. And so, go ahead. I think what you're pointing to is that our housing provider, Champlain Housing Trust, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, Cathedral Square. What everyone's been saying is, 
you can't just give us money to build bricks and mortar. You have to give us the resources to have social workers in there, to have the staff that can help with trauma-informed care. Um, you know, Harbor Place is a great example. Now there's going to be hundreds of units just a half a mile from where I live in Shelburne, um, you know, for people to have their own individual space. That's a lot of people in one place on a, a transportation corridor who probably need help making sure they have the economic tools and the healthcare tools to stay, you know, to stay where they want to be and, you know, in the situation that they want to be in. And Champlain Housing Trust, our housing providers, you know, um, COTS, none of them can do it without the adequate amount of staff. One of the things we did in our budget as well is increase pay for mental health care workers. You know, these are, are, are coexisting. I mean, you know, I, I'm my bias is housing. That's the committee I chair. And so you can't do anything without housing. But you can't help someone keep their housing unless they have health care. And that includes mental health care. And so, you know, we have really tried to look piece by piece in the budget at how we make sure that it's not just housing we're providing people, but a helping hand, somebody to extend their hand and say, I'm here to make sure you're able to keep this housing and break any cycles that are gonna affect your kids. Yeah. No doubt about it. And so you, you got the, you know, you, you always did have the plan. You know what I mean? You know, this, you know, execution is the thing. You know, right? Because you got to go. You know, you, you got to go through what, what you, what you know for a fact is common sense. And you got to go through all of what you got to go to you, for for some common sense. You know what I'm saying? It's like regular. Like you, you, if you're an American, you got to know which ABCs and one, two, three. And that's all. Basically, you saying this, this common sense stuff. Why, why do we have to go? And these people are using the biggest words they can for comments for for uh, elementary school type, you know, explanation. You, you don't have to explain it to them like you're a scientist. You can say, we need to build more housing because these many hundreds of people, thousands, are homeless. You know, I mean, how, how, how simple is that? Right. I mean, so <laughs> one thing I have to remind myself all the time is that the two times that we've had the greatest income equality, so so the greatest equality among people and their well-being was after the Black Plague and World War II. Okay, and I say that not to be a downer. I say that because great upheaval and great crises, unfortunately because of human nature, are often what it takes for us to rebalance and remember our common sense. You know, not overcomplicate things, not, you know, just make things more difficult than they need to be and put hurdles in people's way to have what they need. And the pandemic has been you know, one of those types of events. It, I mean, frankly, we should all stop and remember, this was, you know, and still is an unfolding, painful event for people. Some people, it meant you got to work from home, it meant you spent time with your kids or your dog, but for a lot of people, they lost a loved one, they were sick themselves, they're still dealing with the trauma of that, and they're just too tired for us to run in circles. Yeah. They need us to engage in common sense thinking. And so, you know, I, we, I hate, that we have these crises, I hate that we have this Im immense loss, but sometimes all you can do in that is try to make sure that out of it, you're stronger, you have more common sense at the helm. And I think that's what we've done in the legislature this year is you know, just say, where is the money needed most? Put the money there. Right. Uh, wow, so so another thing too is like after the, after the Floyd um, death, um, and you put on that incredible event, and thank you for letting our art so wonderful be a part of it. Um, so after his death, you know, for for some reason, for some reasons, who you know I've been fighting for, for since we known each other, is we've been fighting for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, justice, ec diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've been fighting for that for forever. Being a people of color, we've been fighting for BIPOC, uh, PLC other other uh, individuals who have their who whoever they are you know what I'm saying we've been fighting for that for years now all of a sudden across the world people need um, racial equity in diversity um, managers you know and, and um, why is that I mean I mean how does that come up now all of a sudden now uh, it's about racial equity it's all about this 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 all sit in the back room and I'm and, or come out the back room sit in the front room all and make decisions together mm -hmm. which is not happening mm -hmm. I sit on I sit on so much stuff you know my it's still it's still the same way you know just uh, they just got policies and procedures written in their um you know who they are about us right. you know what I mean and, um and we hired the equity director oh yeah right <laughs> oh and they black oh yeah yeah and two of them the black ones that was here resigned right you know, Winooski and, and Burlington, yeah. they resigned. Yes. You know, why? Because they said they wasn't getting enough leadership from the from the higher ups. Their 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 
the mayors yeah. actually and um and so you know i hear you I <laughs> Come on, please, I thank you. I, I, I'm, like, I'm trying to say the good words, you know what I'm saying? So, so what, this is, what this is reminding me of is something Taisha Green did. Um, one, uh, one time, you know, I'm trying to remember if it was summer or something, but, you know, at some point, Taisha and her racial equity, inclusion, and belonging team in Burlington did a, an event just for people of color. Um, it was on Zoom because it was early in the pandemic. It was it was in the same year that George Floyd was murdered. And instead of, you know, just us all sitting around and saying, what can we do and how do we make ourselves feel comfortable again? You know, she went to people of color and said, what are you looking for? What do you need? It was really well facilitated. And what even surprised me, because you've heard me say over and over <laughs> again, we need representation. We need more people of color in office. We need people in leadership roles. You know, we need to just have critical mass of people of color in decision making capacity. I thought that was my bias because that's what I do. You know, I thought people would say they want, you know, a, a teen center or, you know, like they want all those things. But what came out of the meeting was the top vote getter for everything was we can't have these things until we are represented everywhere that decisions are made in big enough numbers that we don't have to put ourselves out, um, you know, on a limb in order to say something important and difficult for people to hear. And so, you know, we still haven't achieved that. What we have done is put one isolated person in a role that's impossible for them to achieve success in, and then wondered why they're having a breakdown or why they're not meeting the metrics that someone created. Um, so people are leaving those roles, and those roles are, are being seen as potentially unsuccessful. And I, you know, well, I, I haven't changed what I've said either, probably like mm -hmm. you, which is you can have that role, yeah, but you role. can't put all of the work on that role. Right. If you see that person as the one who's just going to solve all your problems and let you go back to, to not thinking about equity, not thinking about your own complicit way of trying to be comfortable again and not do the hard work, then you are setting that person up to fail. Oh, so yeah, that's what has happened in a lot of these contexts is people have been put in positions where they've been set up to fail. And I almost want to create some kind of checklist where an organization has to say, like, here's the work we've done to get ready to hire this position. Right. Here's what's in place so that that person knows we've done some of the work so they can feel a little safer when they come into this role. Because otherwise, they're not even going to get people of color in any job, right? And right. I keep trying to remind people, we have a workforce shortage. We have a, a workforce crisis, essentially. I mean, everywhere from you can't get a bagel now, you know, at the same hours because no one's mm. working to, mm. you know, we don't have enough surgeons. And who are those folks? They're people of color. 90% yeah. of the population growth in Vermont coming into the state has been people of mm -hmm. color. So if they don't feel comfortable working in your workplace, you don't have a workforce. So this is a selfish reason you need to get it together, but you also need to do the work so that you're not setting someone up to fail yeah. and, try and harming them. Right. And I, you know, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's all the work I do is anti-racism and youth stuff. I'm on the commissioner for Human Rights Commission and other things. But, um, um, you know, I knew this for a fact when I came to Vermont, it was the whitest state in America, right, in 89 when I got here. And so I do know this for a fact in that you cannot change about how things are done if you don't listen to both sides. If, if I'm an equity director or manager or whatever I am in this area, you hire me as a company, I just can't have a black, uh, I'm just like you. If I hire all my staff, it's black people. And so when I sit in my boardroom or my staff room and we talk about issues and concerns and then um, and my team come up, come up with um, what same thing as white people do. You know what I'm saying? Is that you don't really know the, um, um, disparities or you really don't know what white people think you come up with this is what black people think but you know if you have, you need some white people on your team too when you're doing um, um racial justice right and equity because like you know you discussion like you know I'm, I don't know you I know you've been through all these discussions before too a white person say, you know black person say well you know you make me feel uncomfortable I feel stereotyped when you say this and they say damn I didn't know that I didn't know that made you no that's something my grandmother used to say well and I never knew that and so yeah because this is just that because my grandma taught me this that another and then a uh, white person say well you know you you guys really I'm scared or you make me feel this this way that way and so and then so together they can come up with a real good answer mm -hmm. 
You just can't. It's the same damn thing. If you got everybody's black on your team and you making it in the whitest state in America and you making trying to make decisions how things can get better, white people, you know how we can make live together better or what the hell it is, whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, you got to have both. You got to have white and black on your team. Right. You have to. Absolutely. That's the, if you want real, real answers, or you just doing the same thing the white people have been doing for years, right. and they just make their decisions on their own based on what they think. And then how are you gonna think about how I feel and think? Yeah. And you know how are you gonna make a decision how to get better with white people if you don't act think if you don't hear what they think? Right. I mean, I often, often find myself returning to Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s beloved community. And, you know, because he wasn't just saying stop harming us as, as black people and people of color. He was saying, what does it look like when, you know, our whole life isn't defined by this conflict? And his vision of the beloved community reminds me of this quote, you know, that I, I've, I've quoted in an article about the mayor, frankly, which is, you know, the absence of tension is not the same thing as the presence of peace. And so often people say, oh, we want to, you know, remove this person or have this space only so that there's less tension. But that's not the same as us all being together and recognizing what do we need to be able to communicate in, in nonviolent ways, you know, and be in relationship in nonviolent ways. And so much of this country was built on violence and subjugation of, of enslaved black people and, uh, you know, ind indigenous people who were erased that you have to acknowledge that violence to begin to have a conversation that is truly rooted in peace. Right. And so, you know, we need a beloved community. That means everybody. Diversity right. makes us stronger. It's what makes this country great. You know, I, um, I used James Baldwin's quote yesterday um, for Fourth of July. You know, um, I, I love America more than any other country in this world, and it's for exactly this reason that I can criticize her. Um, you know, we need to be critical, and that doesn't mean we don't love someone or love this country. Um, and in fact, the only thing that will make this country great is if we truly can achieve that beloved community. And the closer we get, the more there are people who get angry and uncomfortable who want to roll back progress. So what we have to do, like you're saying, is just keep approaching people with love and a commitment to stay in conversation and in relationship. So, so before we go, before we go. <laughs> what you, else is there to say? Well, we got to talk about Mira. <laughs> Yeah. Mira. So here, here's Next the mic. Generation. Let's talk about Mira. For so there's some it, some change with you oh, these yeah, days. You know, yeah. you, you you got a baby, <laughs> and every time I see you for the 15 years we've known each other, oh, this is a big deal. It is a Come big on, deal. It Mira is a big a deal. Bit. Well, so, yeah. That's your, that's right. Your here's Mira. Here's Mira sleeping peacefully. She has been the whole show, and that says a lot about you know me winning the baby lottery. Mm. She's just a really good, sweet little baby. Um, there's no bad babies in the world, so I don't want to say good like that, you know, but um, she she is traveling with me all over the state. She's been to dairy farms. She's been to the White House. She is experiencing what I'm experiencing. We went to a, a symphony concert last night wow. in, at Shelburne Museum. Wow. Oh, wow. That was awesome. And she's, first of all, you know, just reminding me what I'm fighting for. But she's also reminding me what I'm living for, you know, that that I want her to enjoy the beauty of Vermont, the culture of Vermont, the kindness of everyone. She's experienced so much of that from the day I got to the hospital, you know, people just looking out for me, asking how I'm doing um, to just showering her with affection and and good wishes. You know, she's a lucky baby. We're lucky to live in Vermont. And I just love her. I love her more than anything. Beautiful. So, you got any last things you want to say, Senator? You want to wrap this up? We're going to wrap this you up. You know, right. just the, how much I appreciate you, Bruce. Tell, tell everybody. I just appreciate you because, you know, art shouldn't just be for some and you make it available for everyone. Um, feeling good about your contributions shouldn't just be for some, it should be for everyone. Um, everyone deserves a second chance and a third chance and you make that available for our young people so they don't think of themselves as bad kids or bad people. Um, what you do is incredible in the community, Bruce, and you've been doing it for so long, like you said, just, you know, I appreciate it. I've inherited a better Vermont because of you, and it's always a privilege to talk to you. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much, Senator Rams Hinsdale. You know, I got to ask the last name, too. How long have you been married? 
How long have I? That's a great question. It's been t it's been two years in August. <laughs> I got you. I stumped you. Yeah, that's now. right. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, congratulations. I met your husband, and it was so he's a nice guy. You know, he's definitely that's definitely Amira's definitely daddy's girl. He knew how to handle her. So I saw him grab his girl, and he went out with her outside, and we just started crying. And Jay was out there, and he was talking, and he come back in not not long. He was out there long. Boom, she was quiet and all cool, cool, calm, and collective. Well, so thank you for tuning in to our show today, Straight Talk of My Show. I'm Bruce Wilson, and we'll see you on the next show.